Hey, I'm Javad. As part of a course I teach on Venture Capital, we decided to take a look at a live transaction, the recent BlueX listing on the GEMS board on PSX. Your analysis is only as good as the data you base it on. In our case, the fundamental pillar that drives the valuation of the BlueX case is the size of the e-commerce market. The more effort we put in estimating the size of the e-commerce market as it stands now, as it stands today, and its growth over the next five years, the better, the stronger analysis is. Now the question is, is there rock solid hard primary data that we can look at? And the answer is yes, that data exists in the State Bank of Pakistan's payment system review report. State Bank has been publishing this report and this analysis for the last few years. But the interesting transition point is March 2020, the quarter just before the pandemic hit. When you look at the data going back a year uh, from that point, you'll find that mobile payments, mobile applications, mobile banking users, mobile transfers were already on the rise. But what happened, what changed with COVID was a significant shift to online channels. And from March 2020 to 2021, you'll find that the rate of growth of both mobile payments, mobile banking users, e-commerce merchants, and e-commerce payments made through credit cards took off unlike anything we've seen before. The big question though is, will this trend continue? This, this, this pace of growth that we're seeing, will this trend continue? If you look at the growth rate of adoption of mobile banking applications, the growth rate of increase in mobile banking users, um, the shift, the change, the transition to acceptability of mobile banking payments, the increase in number of registered e-commerce players, the increase in number of mobile slash digital payment options, you will think, you will feel, you would believe that at least for the next 12 to 24 months, there is very little chance that this rate is going to slow down. So that's one part. I think the second part, the most important part is what part of this market will benefit, will attract, will make it more profitable for 3PL players to offer last mile logistic services, e-commerce fulfillment services, e-commerce warehousing services. And that's a really interesting question. With that question comes the assumption that the amount of money that is being spent in changing consumer behavior, very similar to what Kareem did a few years ago with the mobility market, is not just going to impact the hyper-local market. Once you get comfortable with ordering something on your smartphone, once that level of trust is established, once you acknowledge the fact, once you accept the fact that the vendor is not gonna run away with your money, or just ship you an empty package. Once that trust is established, there's a reasonable chance that you may start to experiment with higher value items. There are a few things that need to happen for that trend to take hold safely. And I think we're seeing some of those events come online in this market space. So when you combine all of this together, when you look at the state bank data, when you look at the historical trends, when you look at what's happening in the broader context of society, when you look at what's happening with technology, when you look at what's happening with the new strains of COVID, I don't think the growth rate is going to change in the next 24 months. Will it change over the next five years? Maybe, possibly, yes. Next 24 months, no. If, so if growth is stable as it stands right now, if the market is growing as it stands right now, you have to ask yourself, how big will it get? What proportion of the existing offline transaction will move on to e-commerce platforms? And that's a big question. And that's a question that you have to dig into and find out whether it exists or not. So the purpose of our case today is not to answer all of these questions. The purpose of the case is if you were looking at this opportunity 
what are the questions you want to ask yourself what is the data you want to look at what are the trends you want to examine and what do some of the answers you likely to find imply for the growth and profitability of this business are all e-commerce segments the same the answer is no there are certain e-commerce segments such as consumer goods electronics fashion cosmetics that are strongly correlated with the 3pl segment there are some that are in the middle payments for instance and there are others that are not at all correlated mobility for instance hospitality digital goods and services um last mile deliveries hyper local deliveries these are segments that even if they grow and contribute to the overall growth of the e-commerce segment are not going to have an impact in the growth of the 3pl segment we need to differentiate that we need to adjust our estimates of the market size and the share we could possibly capture as a 3pl player so we need to make adjustments for the growth across different segments segments that are correlated to the 3pl market are the ones we focus on segments that are not we segregate and isolate fashion personal care consumer goods electronics are the segments you want to focus on both in terms of estimating total potential market size as well as growth drivers mobility digital services hyper local last mile deliveries within these the first 3 do not will not have an impact on the 3pl business you can clearly see that while the e-commerce segment is growing growth in specific segments the segments that are correlated with 3pl matters a lot more than growth in unrelated segment for instance taraz food panda kareem bikea it doesn't matter at what rate these businesses grow they're going to they're not going to feed the 3pl business even if some of them are customers of a 3pl player right now it's very much possible that these segments will move towards building and expanding their own internal networks so segregate and isolate them from your e-commerce market size estimates but then on the other hand if you're a small player competing with the big boys you want to make sure that you have a 3pl player on your side that can provide similar if not a better experience compared to the big four players because in the end the delivery experience of your product in front of the customer really drives the overall brand experience for your customers if a delivery is delayed if it's damaged if it's misplaced if it's mistakenly delivered to a different address these are all factors that damage your overall brand making sure that these things don't happen takes a fair bit of commitment on the part of your 3pl player commitment that drives from their understanding of how important the last mile experience is for an e-commerce brand and that in essence is the differentiator for bluex that is what bluex competes on as part of our exercise we spoke to a number of bluex customers and they all said two things when a bluex rider knocks on your door and finds out that you're not there his first act is to call his call center back and then the call center tries to trace you the customer to see if they need to attempt a delivery again if the rider should wait on the spot at the location for you to come back or if there is some kind of an alternate mechanism that they can work out between you the rider and the call center that would ensure that delivery happens most e-commerce players said the same thing again and again the reason why they ship with bluex is bluex makes the commitment tries to ensure that delivery happens not just once but multiple times other logistic providers are not as diligent so that's one differentiator i think the second big differentiator for the same e-commerce customers is the ease the flexibility and speed of payment a large chunk of the e-commerce payments market is cash on delivery how quickly can you ensure that payment is collected from customers 
and reflected in the accounts of the vendors. Now, there are complaints left, right and center across all providers. But with respect to BlueX, or at least the customers that we spoke to, the nature, the frequency and the volume of complaint was significantly lower. From an optional play point of view, payments represent a really interesting space. A 3PL player that can combine, that can find the right set of cards to offer to its vendors on the payment side will stand apart from every other 3PL player in their space. Now, whether BlueX can deliver on that commitment promise, we don't know, but it's an option. From a valuation perspective, there's one thing we have to remember. When we invest in the startup space, when we invest in the ecosystem, we are not looking at linear payoffs. So traditionally, conventionally, when we look at a valuation framework, we have three choices, discounted cash flows or multiples. And the easiest, the most common, the most acceptable, the simplest to explain model is the multiples model. If I look at the offered share price, how does that compare with respect to the most recent years of earning or revenues? We call this the price to earning multiple or the price to sales multiple. And these are good benchmarks to work with in markets that are growing at a linear rate. They're good options to work with. They're good, they're good tools to work with when you're evaluating a business using a linear model. But what if the underlying opportunity is not linear in nature? What if it's an option on growth? And in the 3PL space, the real bet is not on the 3PL business. The real bet is that the growth of the e-commerce market in Pakistan will continue at the same rate that we've seen over the last two years, over the next five years. If that happens, the market is going to be quite significant. The second bet, the segments that we've identified, fashion, consumer goods, electronics, and payments. These four or five segments will also grow at the same pace and rate. The third bet, the underlying business, the 3 p logistics business will be able to scale and grow at a smarter, faster and sharper rate than its competition. If these three bets come together, then the payoff you're looking at is nonlinear. If these three bets come together, then the payoff you're looking at is essentially an option on the growth of the underlying market. Question we need to ask ourselves as investor is what can we do to validate the relationship between these three bets, between the 3PL market and the data we have in front of us? And that is the heart. That's the crux of figuring out how to analyze the Blue X case. If we can do that well, we'll have our answer. Let's summarize what we've learned about our case in the 3PL space. What are the biggest challenges investors have raised against the BlueX valuation? One, using conventional, standard, traditional tools, the valuation is too expensive. Two, combined with the expensive valuation, when you consider that the 3PL space has no real barriers to entry, it's a crowded space, is that valuation justified? Three, Let's take a look at the existing management. How well have they done? What's their historical track record? Just because they have more capital, does that mean they'll do well in the future? How does that relate to the fact that despite being one of the oldest players in this space, they have the lowest market share? Four, are India and Indonesia a relevant benchmark for this market? for Pakistan as a market. Five, will they really be able to realize the dividend from their technology investments? Will they be able to translate that into scale, growth and profitability? Six, is the correlation between growth in the e-commerce market 
and 3PL scale growth and profitability real. That's the biggest, that's the most serious objection. It's possible that e-commerce may do really, really well, but will that translate into improved profitability in the 3PL space? After all, it's a competitive market with, remember, expensive valuations. These are the six biggest, the six most common objections we've seen against the Blue X valuation. But to be fair, there's also a case in favor of the valuation. And surprise, surprise, you'd find that it's the mirror image of the objection that we've just raised. What are the points in favor? Let's take a look. Strong, positive growth in the e-commerce segment growth which is unlikely to stall over the next three to five years. Positive correlation between growth and underlying e-commerce market, growth and profitability in the 3PL space. Three, look at the track record for India and Indonesia in the same space. While we are not the same market, the trajectory is quite similar. Four, significant investment in technology, not just in BlueX, not just in 3PL, but in the entire ecosystem. There's been a substantial flow of capital towards enabling, incentivizing SME players in our space to shift towards technology. Substantial investment through discounts in shifting consumer behavior to e-commerce marketplaces. Even if some of these players die, run out of capital and shut down, their contribution to the space will still stay. The behavioral shifts that have happened are likely to stay. To this, add technology infrastructure at a nationwide level, penetration of smartphones, COVID-driven social and demographic changes. These are all drivers that will shift demand not just on the vendor side, but also on the consumer side. For or against? Your answers to these questions will determine where you stand on the Blue X case. And as it goes with great cases, in this case, the answer is neither easy nor clear.